Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the program, home ownership. In the U.S., like in so many other countries, home ownership is part of the success story dream. A home of your own in a neighborhood that feels safe. Why, after so many years, is that still an unrealized dream for so many people? And why are our cities and towns still so segregated? More than five years since the housing market collapsed, the media have mostly stopped talking about housing policy, but we haven't. Have the problems been fixed? Far from it. It turns out we're not even quite clear what the problems actually are. Are they personal, political, private, or a matter of policy? More important, what does history show we can do to improve things? Nicole Hannah-Jones is an investigative reporter who covers civil rights for ProPublica. Her new ebook, Living Apart, How the Government Betrayed a Landmark Civil Rights Law, explores the decades-long failure of the federal government to enforce the landmark 68 Fair Housing Act. Jennifer Taubes, a law professor at Vermont Law School, who's written extensively about the 2008 financial crisis. Her new book is Other People's Houses, How Decades of Bailouts, Captive Regulators, and Toxic Bankers Made Home Mortgages a Thrilling Business. Welcome both. Let's start with you, Nicole. Segregation. It was 50 years ago that you had Governor Wallace in Alabama saying segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Didn't we end that? Well, in some ways we did. Um, what Governor Wallace was talking about was complete, absolute segregation. And he was speaking, of course, about schools specifically. But um, in housing, we have now more integration, but for many, many communities, particularly the black community, uh, segregation levels have not really changed since 1960. Now, how do you measure it today? Well, you measure it by looking at um, how many, if you take the population of a particular city, and then you can look at how many people of different races live in particular neighborhoods. And so a city like New York City is actually the second most segregated city in the nation. But the white community will say, well, but we don't have white communities like we used to. That's right, and that's why I say segregation now means that we still have it. So you have almost entirely black communities, but there are very few communities that are entirely white. So white um, communities tend to have some level of, of diversity, but there are many black communities where nearly everyone in the community is black. Now, no group lost more wealth in housing wealth than women of color in the financial crisis. Um, Jennifer, what does the mortgage crisis have to do with this picture beyond that? There are many connections because what the mortgage crisis is about, what led to it, as well as the failure to really respond and help people, is tied to predatory lending. How so? Well, if you look at communities of color, um, black communities and Latino communities suffered more in the housing crisis because they were disproportionately targeted for predatory loans. And so even when studies have controlled for things like wealth, the, the, uh, they still bear out that fact. Well, but, but unpack the term for us a little <clears throat> bit. I mean, in some quarters, these were seen as community development programs, helping people get houses. You're calling them predatory. What do you mean? You're touching on what one of the myths are about the crisis. There are still these prevailing stories that the multi-trillion dollar bank bailouts were necessary because poor people who could not afford homes trick bankers mm -hmm. into loaning them money. Irresponsible borrowers. Um, even as I say it, it sounds ridiculous, and it is. The numbers don't bear that out, and it's not true. And one of the um, pieces of legislation that's unfairly targeted for blame is the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. And as you probably remember, this is a law that was designed to deal with redlining, the practice of banks refusing to lend um, by literally drawing on maps, red lines around communities that happen to be communities of color. And so it's actually absolutely not true. And a um, study a report by the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission showed and concluded that this had almost nothing to do with the financial crisis and that the worst loans were actually made by lenders that were not even subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. Now, you mentioned redlining as if everybody knows what that means. I'm going to come to you on this, Nicole. For one thing, it's still striking to me how we misunderstand how housing segregation got set up this way. Uh, redlining was at the heart of it, and yet it dates back to a period people think of as good for social policy, the FDR era. Right. So. 
prior to the Great Depression, actually, we were a pretty integrated society. Most black Americans lived in majority white communities, which makes sense. Black Americans were only, and have been for a couple centuries now, only 12 to 13 percent of the population. So it makes sense that they would live in majority white communities. Uh, but following the Great Depression, you have this desire to really bolster the middle class. Um, and so we have these programs where um, the federal government, led by FDR, decides that he, the government's going to get into the business of insuring mortgages. Prior to that, you had to have between 50 and 80 percent down to buy a house, which of course would exclude almost everyone watching this program. Um, but after that, once the government started to insure loans, you only needed 20 percent down. But uh, the government also decided that there were certain Americans who didn't really deserve that helping hand, and those were black Americans. And so... Was it as explicit as that? It was that, it was that explicit. Black Americans, and to a lesser extent, um, Jews in some places and some other ethnic groups. And so it was the federal government that actually introduced um, redlining. And what they did was they raided certain communities. Certain communities would be deemed the least risky and communities that would also be deemed the most risky. And the most risky communities were literally outlined on a map in red. And these were areas that the government would not insure loans. And of course if the government wouldn't insure loans then the private business industry took the lead from the government and also refused to lend in those areas. And not only would the government not insure loans in black communities, but also in integrated communities. So if you were a white person living in an integrated community, you would suddenly find that you couldn't get loans, you couldn't get loans to repair your homes, you couldn't get loans to purchase your homes, and people couldn't get loans to buy those homes. So whites weren't just fleeing. You hear a lot about white flight. They were kind of edged out by policy, or at least responding to policy triggers. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, there was definitely some of both. There were definitely white people who did not want to live sure. around black people. But in neighborhoods that were already integrated, there suddenly became a financial disincentive right. to have an integrated neighborhood. And so this, this kind of truism that black people brought property values down which we still believe, what actually was the case was it wasn't because black people weren't caring for their property. It was literally the federal government would not loan or insure a loan in a neighborhood. So property values did go down because of that. But it wasn't because of the color of the people moving in, but federal policy that was discriminatory. So you hear this story, Jennifer, and you've just written about a sort of similar phenomenon in a way in the, in the current period. What are the echoes that you hear here? Well, there are a few echoes, and there's also s s some unfortunate irony here, because one of the eras that I say to some degree we should return to is the New Deal era. And one of the programs, um, another program besides creating the Federal Housing Administration was the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And this was an agency that was set up to help people back after the Great Depression who were in a similar position to people today after the 2008 crisis, which was um, they had taken out loans um, to buy a home, and the value of the home plummeted. There was uh, widespread unemployment. So what the Hulk did was get these mortgages, buy them from the banks, and refinance them, reduce principal, and let people stay in their homes. So we but, know what to do right. when we need to do it and when we feel like doing it as a nation. But in 2000, off to 2008, that's not what we did. It's not, and in fact, the, the, the data is really good on this because about one million um, mortgages were refinanced through this, and, and about 800,000, 80 percent of them did not redefault, and that was a huge percentage of the mortgages at the time. The problem was, return to what Nicole says, it wasn't available for everybody. Yeah. You write about a family, the Noblemans, who were a white family involved in insurance out of Texas. Yes. Um, what did they go through? So Harriet and Leonard Nobleman purchased a one-bedroom condo in Dallas. They were trying to downsize a bit. Their daughter was off in college. And they bought this condo at exactly the wrong time. They bought a condo for about $71,000 in 1984. And very shortly thereafter, the prices of condos in the Dallas area plummeted. Then um, Leonard suffered some health issues. Uh, they both had job problems, lost their jobs, got their jobs back, and it turns out the value of their home was only $23,500. That's what you call underwater. They right? were severely underwater in the mortgage. So their lender wouldn't negotiate with them. Other folks in the condo complex had done some restructuring of their loans, but their lender wouldn't budge. So they ended up filing for bankruptcy. 
And their lawyer thought this was a good plan because across the country, um, in many states, if you file for bankruptcy, one of the things that would happen, not just to your other loans, but to your home loan, is that if you were underwater, it would be reduced right. to the value of the condo. That's what they thought would happen. But that didn't happen. The bankruptcy court rejected them. They take it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said no. They were too small to save. And at this very same time, we, the taxpayers, be busy bailing out the banks. Now, the banks say that they've paid it all back with interest. This all worked very well. Problem solved? Well, what's interesting, when you said they, 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 we were bailing out the banks at the time, not just the banks, but actually the bank on the other side of their mortgage had been bailed out. In fact, it, had, it was the survivor of the largest savings and loan to fail in the country. But the story, I have to tell you, when I decided to write about the noblemans, they weren't just a random family. I was writing about them because this Supreme Court case still stands in the way today of people using the bankruptcy process to reduce their underwater mm -hmm. home mortgages. But as I pulled this thread and looked into it, I found out that this bank, American Savings Bank, it gets purchased by Washington Mutual, which then becomes the largest depository institution to fail in this crisis. And then it gets purchased, as we know, WAMU, the, after the parent files for bankruptcy, gets purchased, the bank gets purchased by J.P. Morgan Chase. And in the course of the research, I come to find that the different kinds of um, toxic mortgages that Washington Mutual was putting out there, offering and selling, were introduced through this bank that, were, that stood in the way of these homeowners getting relief. And J.P. Morgan, of course, says, well, but we're just stopping a worse disaster from happening if that bank had gone undertaking with it all those mortgages. Right. Hearing this, I asked Jennifer the question, what echoes did she hear in your story? What echoes do you hear in hers? Or how does it in interconnect with your story around housing segregation? Well, a few reasons. So when we look at why there was support for the FDR programs, there was this belief that this was really helping white um, Americans and the white middle class. When you look at the language around this financial crisis, it was about irresponsible black and brown um, home buyers who were getting loans that they didn't deserve and it was about some kind of PC move by the federal government to help people who shouldn't be homeowners be homeowners. Right. And so it was a very different feeling about who would be getting a bailout. Was it white middle class or was it black and Latinos? Um, I also think that the echo is that the segregation that was created by these federal policies going back to the 1930s made, it, made black and Latino communities targets for this kind of lending. Um, whether or not these banks were being intentionally discriminatory and saying we're going to go out and, and treat black and Latino lenders differently, you had these entire communities that were unbanked. Communities where no matter what your credit was, no matter if you had grade A credit, whether you had high income, you were unable to get traditional loans. And that made people who are where you could target an entire community with these substandard loans that you knew were going to produce very high default rates. We, we once had a woman on our program on a panel with a guy from Countrywide, the mortgage company, and when he accused her of having had no reason to get that mortgage if she couldn't pay it, she said, it was that or having rats crawl over my baby. Mm. There are 11,000 people waiting for Section 8 housing where I live. You don't talk to me about choices. That's what comes across so strongly in your work. What models do you see out there that provide an alternative? Um, you lay out a few in, in your book of not just myths to be done away with, but measures that might help even at this point. There are often courageous folks inside of the administration fighting against the status quo to make things fair. And so whatever ideas that we come up with, you need people like that yeah. in the Congress, in the administration. And recently, someone like Sheila Baer who was head of the FDIC even before she was in that role when she was in Treasury was sounding the alarm about uh, these uh, predatory loans. Um, but so in terms of the various ideas, I think there's kind of a, a parallel track. We need to deal with the problems in the existing system. I used to think the financial system was broken, but after doing this research, I think it's not broken, it's rigged. It's actually working as it's designed to work. And that means that there are winners and there are losers. And the winners are the big banks and the losers are ordinary Americans, the consumers, the borrowers, the taxpayers. And we need to change that. You talk about legal enablers of a toxic chain. I hear that in, in your work too, Nicole. Um, that first question, what happened to caring? Sounds so naive. <laughs> um, and then secondly, what other routes could we have gone down? 
I mean, could we still? Um, the work the work that I do is I kind of have a very long view of history, and I think when it comes to housing, um, this has always been a very difficult issue for Americans. There's a reason why um, real estate agents say location, 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 not house, house, house. You're not buying a house, you're buying into a community, and you're buying mm -hmm. opportunity. And we are very selfish about uh, wanting the best opportunity for ourselves and not necessarily caring what opportunities are left for other people. And I think it's been very hard to overcome that. I also think we have a great deal of, of historical amnesia. So one of the things that I hear when you talk about strong fair housing enforcement is people say, well, that's just um, you know social engineering. The government doesn't need to social engineer which is where I like to point out that the segregation was created by social engineering and we were fine with it then. Mm. Um, it's using social engineering to undo it that seems to be the problem. And rigging the banking system sounds like engineering to me, mm -hmm. in another word. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, it's created um, a lot of these problems. When you have communities that are unbanked and cut off from banking, you leave it open for predatory lending. Um, but there are also people that we don't care so much about in the first place, which is why they're already cut off and unbanked. So then I don't think there's a, as much political incentive for us to make it right. Thank you both. Nicole, Jennifer, great to talk with you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. I was actually at work and I, and I heard gunshots, but I had no clue where they came from. And then when I had got off work, I had drove down the street and his, his father, his father, stepfather, had a sign that said, my unarmed son has been executed by the police. Everybody was just crying, everybody was upset. Like they had they left his body on the ground for four hours without being covered up. I came out the next day and it was the same thing. We basically all, like the community got together and basically was standing together because we just feel like change has to come about because that could have been my little brother. No peace. No peace. Mike was a member of this community. St. Louis isn't that big of a city. Everybody knows everybody. If you don't know a person, you're really uh, only a few degrees away from that person. Um, so, you know, I feel very attached to the story because, you know, uh, I feel that I have some things in common with Mike. I feel like, you know, his, his life story and my life story are very similar. I went to Palestine um, early this year in January, and you know I went through these checkpoints, you know these dehumanizing uh, 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 things where you gotta walk through, you gotta get searched. Basically, like and what I saw in Palestine was like if you're Palestinian, you have to prove that you're not a threat to the system. And it's the same way with us, man, here in Ferguson. You know what I'm saying? If you're a black man, you or, or, or a black woman, we have to prove that like. You know, you don't have to fear us, so you can be safe around us. And if we don't prove that quick enough, we can be killed. I mean, there's a checkpoint right up there. I mean, you know, there's checkpoints here, you know what I'm saying, in Ferguson, you know what I'm saying? If you come on West Forest and if you come in any black community, you see a lot of closed down schools. You see, you don't see enough community centers for black children to go to. I mean, you don't see nothing. You don't see a lot of black business owners. There's not enough jobs out here in this community. I'm seeing these older people working my job and they have family to support. Like, I feel like no grown adult should be making $7.50 an hour if they have bills and they have responsibilities like kids. So how are you to pay this grown woman $7.50 an hour? Or someone that's been working there 20 plus years and you don't even pay them what they really deserve. My little sister, my niece, my little nephews, like I'm fighting for them because I feel like they shouldn't have to live in poverty, they shouldn't have to struggle. I'm hearing a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, a lot of why are we always the ones that are restricted, um, boxed in like animals. You have women who have been a force of activism in the community who also want to be on the front lines and protesting and helping and, and being counted for those efforts, yet a lot of uh, the women are also mothers. So they have that added layer of um, child caring and nurturing and raising their children at home while also wanting to be a part of the movement. We have more than one school district in St. Louis County that has gone through the process of losing accreditation. Both of those districts are have a overwhelmingly large African-American population. However, if you go into other county suburbs, where the racial numbers are reversed, you don't have that same problem. They are top-ranking students. 
um, top ranking resources and access to things like chemistry labs and field trips and textbooks that they can take home and iPads and things of that nature. So not only on an educational front, but a resource, um, state funding and resources, um, having access to fresh produce in your grocery store, having fair pricing of your groceries in your local grocery store. So it's a lot of systemic issues that have lent itself to the issues that we're facing now. And this is not just Ferguson, Florida, but a lot of cities within St. Louis that are mostly African American. You should not be living in poverty if these corporations and these CEOs and presidents are not living in poverty. So that's why we all join together and we all just setting up and fighting for our rights and setting up for basically what we believe in. We got Eric Garner who was choked to death um, in New York City. We got John Crawford who was picking up a BB gun and shot and killed in Ohio. We got Ezel Ford shot three times in the back in LA, man. So to really, you know, see what's happening here and say, man, how can we connect the dots and really have some national movement against like the indiscriminate killing of people of color uh, by these police officers. To me, it's like, okay, man, well, how can we take that, you know, energy? You know what I'm saying? That 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 rage, you know what I'm saying, that anger, and can we manifest it into something into where energy where we can actually connect the dots and change these laws? Don't shoot! U.S. President Barack Obama has ordered a review of the distribution of military hardware to state and local police officers. That's a relief. Americans have been shocked, he says, by the images they've seen of police pointing rifles at protesters after the killing of an unarmed teen, Michael Brown, in Ferguson, Missouri. Obama's ordered a review. Well, that's a relief. Now can we have a review of the distribution of military influence throughout U.S. politics? What we've learned so far is that under a federal program, more than $5 billion worth of military equipment has gone to more than 8,000 city and state agencies since 1997. I found out this weekend that one small town not far from me received six military Humvee vehicles for a police department with 25 officers in it. And mine-resistant trucks aren't the only war tools showing up in U.S. suburbs. Take those gunshot wounds. Mike Brown was shot six times, twice in the head. Ever wonder why so many gunshot victims show up with multiple bullet wounds? It's certainly the cop, it's also the trade. As The Atlantic Magazine reported this summer, every time Congress pays military contractors to develop new killer guns, they transform the commercial market too. The Army gets new, more lethal weapons, and almost at once, those weapons show up at the local gun shop. Why is there so much surplus? Well, defense contractors lobby for it. They spent more than $65 million influencing Congress last year, persuading congressional officials to repeal the promised sequester cuts. Congress handed over almost $497 billion this year, including cash for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the most expensive weapon system in history, and a tank that we already know nobody wants. Now the lobbying group for the country's SWAT teams are lobbying hard to keep their killer surplus. And soon, no doubt, there'll be more of it, because Congress is already hearing from the lobbyists that it must retool the $555 billion it put aside for the Pentagon next year in light of the threat posed by the Islamic State. So, by all means, yes, let's examine the surplus program to police. But let's not stop there. And while we're at it, Obama says the review will be done by White House staff and, quote, relevant U.S. agencies, including Homeland Security and the Defense Department. Here's a better idea. How about residents in towns with all this firepower review the program themselves, especially the people who've been stopped by tanks in their streets and been terrorized not by the images they've seen, but by the experience of assault rifles pointed at their heads. I'm Laura Flanders. For The Laura Flanders Show, you can write to me, laura at grittv.org. Thanks.